This is Robert Stearns. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. I really believe that learning is one of the greatest joys in life. And one of the greatest ways to learn is simply to have meaningful conversations, both with those who come from a similar background as yours, as well as those whose background might be very different. So my hope is that as we connect and converse with leaders from all around the world, that we will learn and grow together. If you're new with us, hit the subscribe button and we'll deliver the new episodes to you right away. So wherever you are, on a run, in the car, at the kitchen table with some coffee, welcome to the conversation. And welcome back. We are in our new season. What is this? I think we're in season four. Season four, Arba in Hebrew of Bishop and the Rabbi. Isn't that amazing? Four seasons. That is incredible. Very exciting. I hope you enjoyed uh, your summer. You enjoyed your break in August. Thank you so much for praying for my sons and I as we took the month of August and spent time mm -hmm. in Israel. We had a wonderful uh, two and a half weeks in Jerusalem and then a week in Tel Aviv. And I'll tell you what, it is just amazing to sense um, the presence of God, the blessing of God, the purpose of God happening in the land of Israel. Welcome back home, everybody, to Bishop and the Rabbi. So excited to see start season four with you. You know the drill. As you come in the room, tell us who you are. Tell us um, where you're watching from, what city, what town. If it's your first or second time, let us know so that we can properly welcome you. Uh, this is the home for Jerusalem-based Christianity. We have found that many people have faith in Jesus, but don't know the faith of Jesus. We've also come to understand that many um, with very sincere hearts, with very good motives, uh, but many are, are worshiping a Jesus who is far more a, a construct of what we call Constantinian Christianity, this Greco-Roman syncretism that really cut off the church from the roots of our faith, which stretch back all the way to our faith father, Abraham. We believe that when Abraham looked up and saw the stars and saw the sand on the seashore, that not only was God promising him uh, his physical seed, his physical family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, uh, the house of Israel, but we believe that also you and I, uh, who are grafted into the covenants of the God of Adonai, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hashem. Uh, we believe that we are a part of that multitude as well. Uh, over and over again, the prophets instructed Israel. They said, when the sons of the foreigner join themselves to you, I think of Isaiah very famously says, uh, those who come and keep Shabbat, those who come and keep the law, those who come and ascend the hill of the Lord, his holy mountain, and that God will make Jerusalem a house of prayer for all nations. And so we get to partake in this amazing journey of faith along with our Jewish brothers and sisters. So we are so happy that you are here. I'm really excited to get started with season four. Let me give you a few very, very quick announcements, and then we're going to launch right back. And we have a special treat tonight. We are starting off with one of our all-time favorite rabbis, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, he is one of our absolute favorites here, but we'll get to him in a second. Uh, this upcoming 15th, um, September 15th, our Heckler Legacy Society webinar is happening at 7 p.m., and each of you should register and be a part of that. It is free. There are no costs. There is no um, obligation, but it will serve you and your family in understanding the importance of preparing your will and having everything in place uh, in your estate. You know, I just saw the tragic uh, passing of a Hollywood actress, uh, Anne Hesh, Anne Hesh. I don't know how you pronounce her last name, uh, but some of you remember her. She did a few films with Harrison Ford and some others. She died in a car crash. 
it was in the news for several days because she she lived on life support for several days. But I just saw today uh, in uh, the in the uh, on the on the internet that uh, she died without a will, and her son now is going. And uh, she was in her mid fifties. I'm I'm assuming that she made a good living. She she made several big Hollywood films. But she had no will in place. And now her children, uh, even though she was in her mid-50s and had never done that, and now her children are left with this circumstance. So we urge all of you, uh, there is no cost, no charge, uh, and no obligation, but be a part of the Heckler Legacy Society webinar Thursday, uh, the 15th at 7 p.m. Then I want to let you know that I'll be ministering uh, in um, San Marcos, California, which I think is just outside San Diego. I'll be there September 9, 10, and 11, Friday night, Saturday night, and two services on Sunday morning. I'm very much looking forward to being there uh, with Kyle Bauer, my dear friend. He is the grandson of Pastor Jack Hayford, one of the heroes, one of the giants of faith. And so if you are in the San Diego area, or if you have friends in the San Diego area, I would love to see them September 9, 10, and 11 at Grace Church. Go to eagleswings.org at events, and you can find more details there. And then I come back from California, and we head right out to Israel. September the 27th, we are leaving for Jerusalem. If you're coming with me, type in that you're coming with me. I know there's several who watch Bishop and the Rabbi, and you're joining. We have a very full, we sold out this year of the tour. It's going to be fantastic. And of course, the day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem on the first Sunday of October. So it's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing time to be alive. It is an increasingly dangerous time in America. Um, sad to say, tragic to say, horrible to say, but we are now uh, absolutely in dangerous times. Um, there is physical violence in our streets, and there is rhetoric um, that is divisive, that is uh, toxic, that is poisonous, and that is attacking the soul of our nation. And so it is so important, more than ever before, that you and I come together as people of faith, as people of hope, as people of goodwill, and we study the Word of God, and we use the fortification that comes to our spirit from studying the Word to reach out and turn a light on, be a light in the midst of this very dark um, time that we are living in. Well, we are certainly living in the days of Messiah, and uh, our our rabbi, it's this rabbi, knows more about the Jewish teachings of Messiah than any rabbi I've ever met. He's made it his life's work. He is a dear friend of ours. Uh, he's been with us several times. I think this is his fourth time with us. And we, we are working on an upcoming class where we want to study the end times together with Rabbi. And uh, But I'm speaking, of course, of none other than Rabbi Lawrence Hajioff. Uh, and would you welcome him back to Bishop and the Rabbi? There he is. How are you, sir? Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be back with you, uh, Bishop. I really enjoy these sessions so much. And the feedback I've been getting from my audience, Jewish and non-Jewish, has been incredible. So again, thank you so much for having me back. I really enjoy our time together. Well, Rabbi, it, the feeling is mutual. You have such a spark about you. There's such a sense of, um, of clarity in your thinking. Your words carry strength and carry importance and and. Uh, words spoken from the heart go to the heart. I know that's a Jewish saying, and uh, we really are honored that you take time to teach our community. It means the world to us. And um, and uh, so, Rabbi, you're you are number one here in our first uh, our, our first session back after our hiatus, and uh, we are ready to dive in. Uh, but I, I am saying this, Rabbi. We really do want to do. Uh, a three or four session class soon with you. I know I have not spoken to you recently about this. We spoke in the past, but we've had several planning meetings. What I'm trying to find is I'm wanting to find a Christian theologian 
who is an expert in Christian eschatology. So we can kind of study the two together. And uh, we have a, a few that we've interviewed. But see, generally speaking, in the Christian world, uh, you're locked into one eschatology or another. So you're either what we call pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. This is a whole realm of study that's a bit arcane. But I'm trying to find a Christian theologian who's an expert in all of these and who's willing to kind of present all of them and then have them in dialogue with you. So we are working on that. I want to let you know. Good. But Rabbi, today we are here to talk about the Parsha of the week. And folks, I want to direct you to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21, but we begin in verse 10, all right? As you know, our uh, chapters and verses are not how the Hebrew lines up. Uh, these were put in by King James, good old King Jimmy, uh, and I think 1611 started our chapters and verses. Uh, so we're going to go and follow the Parsha. Uh, and Rabbi, I believe it's called Kitsitse, is that correct? Yeah, Kitsitse. Kitsitse. Yeah. Begins in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. And uh, Rabbi, I know this is an important Parsha for many reasons, not the least of which, of the 613 mitzvot, the 613 commandments, uh, 74 of them are in just this Parsha alone. So that is a pretty robust amount, a pretty robust percentage of the commandments just found in this Parsha. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And if you see the main uh, thrust of the topics in the Parsha, it will make a lot of sense because there's a lot to be said on the uh, themes that appear. And it's not just academic discussion, as we're going to see in a few moments. The ideas that are being discussed take on a very strong legal a ramification for everybody involved as we're uh, as we're going to see yeah all right so kitsitse 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 did i get it right now okay so rabbi take us what does that mean let us launch with the meaning of that okay so the word kitsitse means when or if and that's important that's actually four translations to the word but let's go with when or if you go out le milchama to war when or if you go out to war? Now, that's interesting because it should just be, if it happens and you go to war, then this should be the way you act, what's going to motivate you, how you should act before the war, during the war, even after war comes um, to your nation. However, there's an assumption that it's going to come because that's just life. Part of uh, world history, even history now, this is so topical, by the way. You know, it's just as an opening uh, chapter for your new season, Bishop. Um, yeah. This is where it's all happening because this is really the discussion of how to act in war and what's going to motivate you when you go to war, what's in your mind, how are you going to react to your fellow soldiers, to the people who are captured, to your environment. All of this takes on such prominence in the world today as it's found in the parasha in the Torah portion this week. Well, you know, this is so important. And, and there's a few things that come to mind immediately. Number one, Jesus in uh, the book of Matthew, I believe it's chapter 24, when he speaks about the coming messianic age, uh, he says he prophesies that one of the signs of the messianic age he says that there will be wars and rumors of wars, that in other words, there'll be a, a season of heightened conflict. And then I'm thinking also, and I can't recall, somebody will put it in the comments for us, but there's a scripture that says, you know, they say peace, peace when there is no peace. Mm -hmm. and, and we look at our world right now, you look at institutions like the United Nations or the, the, the World Council of Churches, or these, these, you know, kind of global organizations who are all, you know, setting these lofty goals for peace. But my goodness, you look at Russia and Ukraine, you look at China saber-rattling Taiwan, and China's 
really war on America right now that's happening through uh, TikTok and through all of these various oh, we means. Are, the there is no doubt that war has changed. It's evolved. The idea yep. of bows, arrows, and swords, that's so 1850. We that's are right. at war right now. And if you don't realize that, you really are missing some gray matter. War has changed. And the idea of, first of all, let's just talk about one type of war, self-defense, okay? Even the Israeli army, which, by the way, is the most moral and ethical army in the world. And those people who want to know more about this, just look at the words of Richard Kemp. He's a, a British officer, talks a lot about this, and he's an honest man. It's called yeah. the Israeli Defense Forces. So defense is the greatest reason to go to war in order to defend yourselves. I know we live in the world today, war is a bad thing. It's not. Jewish people and Jewish history is not made, and Jewish thought is not made up of pacifism. We are not pacifists, you know? I, right. I, I really detest hearing that because it's so inaccurate. Sometimes you need to go to war to defend yourself. And sometimes, Bishop, that war needs to be proactive. In other words, we're being attacked, cyber, like you said, China is at war with America, if not the entire world. How right. many attacks do we have to push off, right, in Israel and America today from China? There must be millions of cyber attacks against the world today coming out of China. You don't see it. It's hidden, but it's there. And you're right. That, that verse you quoted of peace, peace, everyone talks about it. This is nonsense. This is, this is a great shame that people are not willing to open their eyes and see officially in the world today. There are officially 27 wars happening. <coughs> Some of them are really big. You mentioned Russia and Ukraine, although that doesn't seem to get much, too much press anymore, you know? That's so right. yesterday's news, but it's still happening. Well, it's and we're, we're, we're moments away from a nuclear Iran, and, and this current administration, uh, you know, has somehow made the decision to move forward with this Iran deal, which is just, you know, uh, terribly going to upset the balance of power, not only in the Middle East, but in our world. But Rabbi, people look at people like you and me, and they say, you're religious leaders. You should only be speaking about peace. You, you, you know why? You know, you should. And, and they put on us this sense of guilt and shame that we're even willing to discuss, you know, issues of war, issues of, like you say, self-defense and the need to fight for uh, life, to fight for principles, to fight for what we believe in. I, I like what you said a few, uh, you, a few moments ago. A few moments ago, you said, you said, you know, Scripture does not call us to be pacifists. Yeah. I think this is extremely important. Could you expound on that? Yeah. First of all, we're fighting for something even greater than everything you just said. Although what you said was very true. We're fighting for truth. Right. This is what the, every war you're seeing today is really the, the fight of truth between good and evil. And those who attack us are really fighting holiness. That's what this is coming down to. They don't describe it that way because then they're really admitting it, but that's what's happening. Now, how you act when you are in war, that we can have a discussion about, right? So to turn around and say that we're pacifists, I think Gandhi, uh, which I know it's going to sound maybe not so so PC, was not such a lover of the Jewish people and said that maybe we were slightly to blame for what happened during the Second World War because we were not passive enough in our resistance. I don't know how passive the guy wanted us to be. This Good idea man. of being a lamb to the slaughter is not right. a mitzvah. If they come to attack you, the Bible tells us, you go and get them first. And these attacks are coming throughout the world. We see in right. France today, the anti-Semitism, I don't need to talk about anti-Semitism, but these small incidents are just uh, <coughs> smaller aspects of a much bigger war that is coming out against us. And even, I know you know this, there is a war inside America as well, right? We're being attacked from without and within. And we are entitled and expected to protect ourselves. And it's called in Hebrew a milchemet rashut. That is a war of option. That means you are entitled to go to war in order to protect yourself and to proactively stop those outside forces. We're seeing with Iran today, although Israelis never admit to it, 
but you see these assassinations that are happening and the criticism right. that Israel gets for it. These assassinations are targeted and they are a mitzvah. Yes. Because the result of these individuals really developing nuclear weapons or any form of warfare against our people is going to be 10 times worse, if not a thousand times worse, heaven forbid. And therefore, the Torah tells us when you go to war, you have to keep your humanity. I feel one very interesting law that appears in this week's Torah, Torah uh, parasha portion. You know, when you're going to war against a city and the city is well fortified, you're entitled to knock down the walls in order to, well, how are you going to do that? So they used to cut down trees and use them as ramming rods to smash open the door so they can have exposure to the enemy within. Even over there, the Torah says, and this still applies, you're not allowed to cut down a fruit tree. Wow. Even in the midst of war, when you are there defending yourself, protecting your people, protecting your families, not a fruit tree, because that brings life and goodness. So even there, we keep our humanity. But don't mistake that for a pacifism that says war is evil and therefore we shouldn't go and protect our families and protect our lives and our communities from people who really want to hurt us. And that's why the Parsha says, not if, but when. When you go to war, because there are always going to be people who are going to come to hurt us and you are expected. It's not comfortable and it's not always pleasant, but it's a mitzvah to protect yourself from those enemies, whether those enemies come with bows and arrows, knives, swords, nuclear weapons, or cyber threats, which, by the way, my wife and I read a lot on this cyber threat coming out of China, and the threats coming through are horrendous, of 90% of Americans could be dead because of a effective cyber war, heaven forbid, against the, right. our country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Rabbi, this is this is intense stuff. And folks, I, I want us to realize uh, the there are forces who only want to paint Jesus as a uh, a mild pacifist. And they they simply have not read the totality of scripture. Uh, they they've certainly not read verses where Jesus says plainly, I've not come to bring peace, but but to bring a sword. Uh, this is a scripture you don't hear preached on or hear quoted. Uh, you don't see the book of Revelation quoted where Jesus is portrayed as a man of war, a, a man of a righteous uh, man of war. And I want to urge us to not fall into this social justice kind of veil that is coming across much of the world today, um, that is that veil, that mentality that it's peace at all costs. Uh, and we move to appease the enemy and you appease and appease. Uh, Winston Churchill said that uh, an appeaser is someone who uh, feeds the alligator in the hopes that he gets the alligator eats him last. You know, if, if, if an alligator is coming for you, you're in trouble. Um, we've really got to wake up and get our thinking clarified on this issue. Um, even more so the church, much of what we're dealing with in the American church is that the American church has never suffered persecution. Uh, so many times I tell my Jewish friends, my Jewish friends will say to me, Bishop, how come you're not, the, the, the Christians are not more active in fighting against Christian persecution in Africa and these different places in Asia. Uh, why don't we hear an outcry from the church? And I say to my Jewish friends, you have an advantage over us. You have the advantage of 3,000 years of persecution. Uh, yeah. The Jewish community has endured 3,000 years. The, 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 um, I think it's the Megillah. I don't know where it is, but it says in every generation, they rise up to attack us. It's in the Seder, I think. Yeah, I got that. Seder, that's right. The Seder, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely correct. In every generation, they rise up to attack us. Uh, but our, you know, we move with God and God makes a way. And so there is a outlook. There, there is a mentality 
of being aware and being on the defensive and when necessary on the offensive. And this is something that is not present in American evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. We're we're in this pie in the sky Christianity, me and Jesus waltzing our way to heaven, me and Jesus worried about, you know, all the ways that he's going to take away all my problems. Folks, we've got to wake up. Uh, there is intensity in our generation, and we need to respond to it. Now, Rabbi, we've got two things we're dealing with here. We've got, number one, the reality of, listen, uh, when you go to war, be be expecting that there's going to be a time to go to war. But then on the flip side, yeah. here is how you wage a righteous war. Here is right. how in the midst of warfare, you don't lose your soul. Right. You don't lose your humanity. You don't become the very evil that you're fighting. And so take us through this Parsha, Rabbi. There's so much in it. And begin to mine out for us some of the truths there. Okay, so let's start with a couple of them. The first one is how to deal with captives in war. Now, remember, war in the days of the Bible didn't last for, you know, a couple of weeks, a month, a year. It lasted for many, many years. And therefore, right. the way that the soldiers acted on the battlefield and dealing with the families after battle was a big challenge, especially men who are away from their families, away from their wives, away from their girlfriends, whatever it was in those days. They could be acting in ways that was against what the Torah says. And therefore, one of the first things it says when you go out to war is how to treat women in war. And not just Amazing. to take advantage. I mean, you do realize that all forms of war to this very day, rape is one of the main ways that they would attack and demoralize. It isn't just a sexual act. It takes on sexual right. form. But it's also a form of taking control and uh, mentally beating the enemy. Over here, the Torah says that's not acceptable. And therefore, even though there may be a single woman or single daughters to the men who are fighting, there is still a mitzvah to treat these women with respect. And if they want to join your people, which in many cases they did want to, right? Because in those days, marriage wasn't always about love. It was about self-preservation. Then these women need to give it a chance to mourn the loss of their loved ones and to convert and join the Jewish people. And if they did not want to, they were left alone. And therefore, how you act towards the opposite gender, if I can still use that word, to against women was very, very, that's one of the first stipulations before anything else when it comes to war. And that is called the idea of the Eshet, Yafat To'ar, the woman who was encountered the battlefield, don't think you just use her for your own purposes and then discard her, which is standard warfare in the world throughout history. That is not acceptable. Treating people with respect at the time of war is a major aspect of what that war is about. That's and I just, want, I just want to point out, Rabbi, in this time where religion is being vilified as you know, the cause of uh, uh, an anti uh, anti feminism or anti this, you know, religion is blamed for everything. Yeah. I mean, here you have this ancient text, you know, talking about war, and what is what does God do, and what do the Jewish people do? They say, here's how you treat not only your enemy because these captives were their enemy, but but also women. So you're dealing with both gender and enemy, and the scripture is elevating both of them here. Absolutely. I mean, this is extraordinary. And this, these are the truths that do not find their way, God, you know, on, onto the view or onto mainstream media as they just broad brush stroke religion and, and call religion so bad and so horrible. No, folks, the scripture is filled with moral guidance that elevates uh, the other that elevates the stranger in power, even in times of war. Right. So we see that, Rabbi, these first few verses. Go, go on from there. I, I want to add another piece. You just struck something in my mind. I must say it. You know, when Moses and the Jewish people went through the Yams of the Red Sea after leaving Egypt, seven days after leaving Egypt, you know, many, many Egyptians died at that time as they were swallowed up by the waters. You'll see that the Jewish people wanted to celebrate and were ready to celebrate while the Egyptians were drowning at that war. And that was a war that was fought by God. Actually, we see all wars ultimately 
being conquered by God. It's based upon our faith in God that success will come. It's also a very, very important point I want to mention. However, over there, God says, no, do not rejoice now. When you see your enemy fall, do not sing. You could be grateful to God and you can thank God. But singing and dancing, which, by the way, we see on the Palestinian streets, you know, their, right. their view of war is is antithetical to anything of a religious person. When they see young children being killed in cafes or stabbed in their homes, they will celebrate and hang out cookies. You will never see that from the Jewish people in the land of Israel or anywhere else. If they do, they're doing a terrible mistake or misjustice. Because we say that when your enemy falls, Altismach, do not be happy. You could be grateful to God that your life is being spared at that moment. But everyone is made in the image of God, even your enemy. And therefore Moses was told by God to calm the people down. And they sang as he shared this beautiful song of gratitude to God for what he did. But there was never a celebration. And you'll see, by the way, as a side point, even in Israel today, you see a lot of these uh, dictatorships like North Korea, or Russia. They'll have these big marching, like um, military outfits with the tanks and the soldiers goose stepping together. You see it. You never see that in Israel. This glorification of war is also antithetical. You know, you see these Russian soldiers covered in medals, which I think if someone tried to shoot them, they'd bounce off. Maybe it's like a, a self-defense system. This is not a Jewish view. I've been to many army camps when I've led trips to Israel, which you know as well. You've done so. And in the army camp, it's difficult to know who the officer, the general of the camp is, right? Of the particular right. base, because, you know, he looks and talks like everyone else. There's no right. glorification of war. It's a, I don't want to call it a necessary evil, because it's not evil. War is right. not evil. People act evil when they're in war. That's true. But war itself <coughs> can be and should be a force for the good. I know it's so difficult to our, you know, 2022 ears that we've now unfortunately adjusted to. But war, without war, without strong armies, without a a, a passion for for taking care of yourself and self-respect, everything will be lost. And so the enemy from outside and inside need to be understood and recognized. Folks, this is just so timely for us in our journey, in our life uh, at the moment. Um, of course, these words are timeless and they're applicable in every generation, but uh, seem so absolutely important for us today. Um, uh, Rabbi, just continue to lead us through here. Uh, there's there's so much in this Parsha, but I know that the overarching thing really is this theme of how to deal with conflict, how to yeah. deal with war. And it leads up to really kind of the, if I can say the nemesis, the arch enemy of the Jewish people, right. which is the Amalekites. Yeah. Uh, you know, you see the Amalekites over and, and aren't the Amalekites present because, do I have this right? Because King Saul uh, didn't do what God told Very him well, to do. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Absolutely. We know that King Saul, who was a great king, the first king of Israel, had the opportunity to wipe out this nation. And this nation, we'll see in a moment, were really the epitome of evil. There are some people who are so bad, there is no restitution. You cannot make peace with them. Many Jews to today, actually going back 70 years, have seen the Nazis as the epitome of who a Malik are. And a Malik can be described as the people who, no matter what you give them, no matter how much you try to appease them, they are never satisfied and want to see your downfall. This is the only nation from all the nations in the world that's discussed in the Bible and since that we have no time for. And if they act according to their morals and principles, which most of the time they do, you need to destroy them. And King Saul had the opportunity to destroy them. And yet he had a misplaced compassion. Those words are very important. A misplaced compassion. He let Agag, <coughs> Agag the king of Amalek, live one extra night. He was able in that one night to procreate. He was then chastised by the prophet, and he ended up killing him a day late, but it was too late. He'd already had a chance to pass his seed on, and a mullet still stands. And actually, King Saul lost his kingship, and it shifted yep. from the tribe of Benjamin to the tribe of Judah, the tribe of David, King David and King Solomon. Because of this one mistake, misplaced compassion <coughs> when it comes to war, he should have wiped out King Agag and a Amalek, are descendants of Agag, which is why Haman from the Purim story is referred to as 
the Ben Agag, the descendant of Agag, he was an Amalekite. And you see wow. Haman in the Purim story, how he's nothing can appease him. He has all the money in the world, all the power, all the honor. All that means nothing because one Jew, Mordechai, will not give him the respect he wanted. And instead of going after Mordechai, he went after all the Jewish people. That is Amalek. And Amalek are still here. The rabbis tell us they must be because the Mashiach cannot come until the hand of Amalek is wiped out from this earth. So Amalek yes. are clearly still in the world. The other nations, the Midianites and the Moabites, they may be gone or they may have been completely mixed in, that they have no relevance. But Amalek are there. Now, they may not be. This is important. I want your, I want your listeners and viewers to know this. They may not be an entire nation. They may be spread out. And they are right. spread among other nations. There are Malik in America today. There's a Malik in Russia, very clearly. There's a Malik in Ukraine. Make no mistake. Right? I know we look for, we want the simple view of black and white. There's good and baddies. It's not so simple. It's a bit more yin and yang. There's some good in the bad and some bad in the good. This nation of a Malik, however, has one unifying trait. When you see people who come to attack us and nothing you can do, can appease them. You can offer them everything in the world. And yet it makes no sense that they're still attacking you, just like the Nazis, right, were fully able and willing to keep attacking us, although they were fighting wars on every front. That is a trait that is a malik. And that evil must be uprooted from the world. Mm. Mm. Wow. Intense things, Rabbi. Intense, intense words. Intense. I, I apologize. <laughs> we'll do other parts here that have less intensity, but you know, yeah, no. we're living in intense times. This is the world we're living in, my friend. This is absolutely and if right. We don't wake up to this reality. As you said, you said to me pre show in the preamble, yeah. you told me that you know, we're living in a world where in the Christian world, but it's happening in the Jewish world too. People are not recognizing the threat. And you know, right. we have it in the Jewish world too. People are just so involved in in watching and just letting every new story just pass by and believing everything they're seeing on social media without actually opening their eyes and their minds and their hearts to the reality of the threat that we are feeling today. There is an existential threat that is coming against us. And the prophet tells us that before Mashiach comes, there will be a war of Gog and Magog. And I have a chapter in my book that I discuss this war. It's not too clear who this nation is. I have my own thoughts and ideas, which I'm not going to share right now. It's another discussion mm -hmm. I would love to have with your viewers, but I need to flesh it out a bit more to really prove why my thinking is going this way. But this idea of Gog and Magog, these one or two nations who come against us, against each other, or some say actually against the Christians and the Jews may not be part of it. There are opinions that say that. Jewish sources yes. say Gog and Magog actually is going to be viewed by the Jewish people, actually going to be involving the Christian world primarily. Hmm. And the battle is going to be the final <coughs> battle of good and evil. And you've got to use one thing, said the rabbis. This is unanimous to help you through that, and that is faith. You must have faith in God. Faith will get you through every war. And I mean literally every war, whether it's a personal internal war or a existential war that we are facing right now faith is the key solution that will redeem us and bring the ultimate biat hamashiach the arrival of the mashiach the messiah to come and bring peace on earth hmm. rabbi we have just a few minutes left uh, this has been a powerful time together let me ask you let's close with that last um, theme that you raise the theme of faith what do you do to maintain and strengthen and express your faith? We're bombarded with negative reports. We're bombarded with the things of the world. What do you do? What are the practical steps that we can take to keep our faith strong uh, and to keep our faith active, to keep our faith growing in the midst of this challenging season? You know, it's so refreshing to even hear that question. Almost what I say is almost irrelevant 
just to know that question is being asked, because that is not a question I get from my Jewish students. You know, I teach at university, as you know, I have this semester, 150 students. They ask me, is this kosher, right? Should I marry that guy? No one seems to be asking me how to grow in faith. So thank you, Bishop, for bringing that question. And maybe my students will watch this. But it's a very, very important question. I'd like to share, if you don't mind, just a couple of answers. And I can't believe this time has gone so quickly. I have so much more to say, but God willing, I'll be invited back because I do enjoy our time together so much. Friends. And I really do want us to do this three or four session, you know, thing that gets into Gog and Magog and all of this. We're really going to do that. Be glad to do that with you. Friends, when I talk about faith, I'm talking about building a deep, true, emet, truthful connection with God. And that's going to be different for everybody. But first and foremost, you need to talk to God. You need to have an active daily relationship with God. And that means to pray. Now, I can't define prayer for you, right? We Jews are obsessed with just going through the Siddur, the Jewish prayer book, and just speed reading through it. That is not what builds faith. What builds faith is an open, honest conversation with God. Talk to God. The rabbis say, just like God is your friend. It's an exchange. You know, if there's one-way communication, that is a dictatorship. If there is a two-way communication, that is a relationship. And when we learn Torah, that is God talking to us, the Bible. But when we pray, that's us talking to God. So there needs to be this ability. And people get embarrassed by this. So don't do it publicly. Just open your heart to God. Eshpoch ed nafshi, says the prophet. Let your heart open up and pour out your soul to God. Because sometimes people lay you down, but God won't. So that's number one. I want to add another piece over here, and that is studying history through the lens of the Bible. And why is that important? These stories you read about in the Bible are not really there like, you know, Aesop's fables. You know, we're not reading Macbeth over here. These are truths. These are talking right. to our heart. And therefore, when you see what happens to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we see what happens to all our great prophets, these stories that are brought down, because there were many things that happened to them, but the ones that are brought down in Tanakh, into scriptures, are there to inspire us, to let us believe, well, you know, if King David was saved after all the trials and tribulations, maybe I could be saved. And when King Solomon talks about the Yumei Chorfi, the days of my childhood, my younger years that were so difficult, they were like winter days. I relate to that. And therefore, learning the Bible, learning the Torah, gives us such a beautiful way to understand what our ancestors went through so that we can relate to God in a very similar way. These weren't supernatural individuals. They were human, of flesh and blood, just like ourselves. But you don't pick that up until you study the Torah and you have someone who can relay that information to you in a way that you can wrap it up and bring it into your heart. And therefore, faith is built on two things primarily, and that is to talk to God and let God talk to you through the Torah and through these experiences that we right are having right now, Bishop. Yeah. Oh. There's a um, his name escapes me. I feel badly that I can't recall it at this moment. But he's a, a rabbi we've had on recently from Efrat, and he's really one of the few rabbis I've encountered who seems to go against what I've heard is the prevailing thought of the rabbis in believing that the prophetic spirit. Um, this ability to hear God and commune with God and receive from God, he believes that that is being restored to the Jewish people um, and that um, that there's an increase of that in these days. I hear most other rabbis tell me that they believe that the, the age of prophecy has ceased. Um, but uh, what I hear you saying is, and this is so similar to what we practice in our Christian tradition is that our hearts have to be open to hearing from God. Absolutely. Uh, if, if you hear from him in the written word uh, and, and the written word tells us what it says, all creation declares the glory of God, which means when I contemplate nature, when I contemplate the natural order, I can see the majesty and the symmetry of God at work 
all around me. Were you going to say something, Rabbi? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I absolutely. Ma yeah. says the prophet. How wonderful are your ways. And that's actually a third way we build faith. You know, put the phone down. At least we have Shabbat, right? I know right. for 45 hours I get my children's undivided attention. They may not be happy about it, but they have it. Put it down. Go outside, commune with nature. That's a third way to build faith when you see God's beautiful creation. You know, we've yeah. unfortunately we've become viewers of life and not mm. active participants. This is I one of the that. great challenges that we, the Jewish people, have had with the next generation. Yeah. So important, Rabbi. Folks, we could go on and on and on, but our, our time has, has absolutely oh, come to a close. I'm, I'm sorry. So <laughs> Listen, we would love you to be back soon. Um, and uh, this has just been a fascinating time. Folks, help us out. Hit the share button. Post this. Share this. Uh, and you've got to get a hold of Rabbi Hajioff's books. And also, he has so many other valuable teaching tools uh, on YouTube and his social media. Rabbi, how do people find you and follow you? Thank you. Firstly, most importantly, just type in the name Rabbi Lawrence Hajioff. I'm the only Rabbi Lawrence Hajioff in the world. So just take this title over here and uh, my classes will come up. But first, okay. I want to say thank you so much for having me. It really means a lot to me. And I always come out of our talks and the discussions enriched. You know, we once met in a Starbucks. I don't know if you remember when our mutual friend Kenny Jenner introduced us. And I came out of the conversation like, wow, this guy gets it. And I don't say that about many people. I don't say that about most rabbis I meet, unfortunately. So again, I really appreciate it. And I, I, it's a heartfelt um, uh, gratitude that I have towards you and your viewers for sticking with us for uh, for so long. But yeah, type in my name. My books are available on Amazon. My classes are all uh, on YouTube, my university classes and my home classes. Just watch, enjoy. You can always write to me by my website, rabbilawrence.com. I'd love to hear from you guys, uh, which I do actually after the show. And uh, God bless you all. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this uh, production. And folks, I want to encourage you. I mean, Rabbi is a dynamic speaker. Uh, if you have classes and seminars and he speaks all over the world on these topics, he's really a gift to this generation. So uh, get in touch with him and find out how he can bless your um, community. Thank you. So folks, it's been an incredible beginning to season four. We're so glad to have you all back with us. And we'll be together over these next few weeks before we head to Israel. We'll still be going while we're in Israel and heading towards the day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem on the first Sunday of October. Until we are together again, be blessed, be strengthened, chazak ve'amatz, be strong, and have good courage. Rabbi, we appreciate you so much, sir. Thank you. All right, everybody, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem.